So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to be uh, respectful of everybody's time. I'm sure that some other reporters are going to trickle in. Welcome to today's briefing um, on the subject of health care consolidation. Um, I'd like to thank our partners Health Affairs and the JKTG Foundation uh, for their support of this briefing. And um, I'm actually going to turn it over to uh, Alan Weil, who is the editor of Health Affairs, to, um, uh, to get us started. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, I'm Alan Weil, Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. We're really happy to have you here. It's a great uh, pleasure to have a panel full of lawyers. Uh, <laughs> we don't get to do that very often, so it's a particular joy. Uh, I'm just going to give uh, literally a, a two-minute uh, introduction to the topic so that we're clear uh, how important uh, th this morning's conversation is for uh, health care. Uh, the a consistent theme in health care right now is consolidation. Uh, but there are tremendous, uh, vari there's tremendous variability in how that's playing out in different parts of the healthcare sector. Uh, we have uh, consolidation within the healthcare provider community, both horizontally and vertically. We have hospitals and physician practices uh, merging and consolidating. We also have it uh, vertically with uh, alignment between hospitals, physicians, home health agencies, and the like. We have uh, consolidation going on in, in the pharmaceutical industry. We have consolidation going on in the insurance industry. So at one level, you'd think, well, this is all consolidation, and we just need to figure out whether that's a good or a bad thing. But it turns out that the rationale offered for these different sectors is quite variable. Uh, in the, the horizontal mergers are really to, to build, a, designed uh, purportedly to build efficiencies and to improve uh, information flow. Uh, within a sector. Similarly, vertically, we're, we're changing payment models, and that suggests the need for alignment uh, between hospitals, physicians, and other healthcare providers to uh, provide uh, more continuity of care. In the pharmacy space, in addition to the tax issues, which I don't know that we'll get into today having to do with uh, international borders, there's the high cost of drug discovery and bringing products to market. And in insurance, the rationale is everyone else is doing it, and if we don't do it, we can't negotiate uh, effectively against a consolidated provider system. So uh, consistent theme of consolidation, but tremendous variability in the rationales offered. Uh, at Health Affairs, we publish uh, a lot uh, that's relevant, but it turns out that uh, the legal structure and the evidence base for whether these mergers are a uh, good or bad thing ultimately for consumers is pretty thin. The, the, the legal structure really comes out of an industrial era, and the economic analysis doesn't primarily uh, around consolidation doesn't primarily come out of healthcare, and it certainly doesn't primarily come out of insurance. And those, uh, the changes going on in those two fields are, are, are an important backdrop. So, uh, so we've got a lot to cover. And uh, uh, I'll turn it back to Marilyn to introduce those, uh, our, our speakers this morning. Fantastic. Thank you, Alan. The one thing I wanted to point out in your packets is that you, you do have a piece um, that comes from the, from the LA Times on um, uh, inversions. And we are not going to focus so much on inversions today, although, of course, we are going to focus, um, uh, we are going to talk quite a bit about uh, pharmaceutical um, industry consolidation. But um, uh, the, the reason that we put this piece in here, even though we're not going to get much into it today, is that there is legislative activity brewing in this area. Um, if you're not familiar with inversions, the, these are deals that involve uh, foreign companies and moving headquarters overseas uh, with a, uh, the purpose of avoiding uh, taxes um, or, or lowering taxes. So you do have a piece in here about this, and, and there could be legislation, we understand, coming up as early as January or February. So with that, let me introduce our speakers today. Uh, on the other side of Alan, we have Debbie Feinstein. She's director of the Bureau of Competition at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, she uh, has also um, uh, been a partner at Arnold and Porter, working uh, in their um, or heading their U.S. antitrust practice group. You have full bios in your packet, so I'm just going to give you the highlights here. And on Debbie's other side is George Slover. He's senior policy counsel at Consumers Union. Uh, he has served in all three branches of the government here, including the House Judiciary Committee, the uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee, and the Department of Justice. 
um, in their antitrust division. And to my left is uh, Andrea Marino. She's a partner and co-chair of Goodwin Proctor's antitrust practice. Uh, like all of our panelists today, she has um, done double duty or triple duty, and she's been at the FTC. She's been at the Department of Justice. Um, so we have a, a really uh, exciting panel today. So I'm going to turn it over to each of them to give us a, a, some introductory remarks, and then uh, we'll open it up for your questions. So I'm going to turn it first to Debbie. Great. Well, thanks. It's really um, uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have to start with the usual caveat that my views are my own and not necessarily those of the commission or any individual uh, commissioner. Um, I want to talk to you briefly, because um, I'm interested in your questions about what you want to hear about, about a couple of areas. Uh, I want to start with uh, a couple of overview points. Um, first, the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice Antitrust Division share juris jurisdiction uh, in the antitrust area, and typically the FTC does uh, provider side um, transaction, so hospitals and pharmaceuticals. Uh, the Department of Justice looks at insurance mergers, so I'm not going to be able to talk with any specificity about the insurance mergers because that's what DOJ covers. I, I can talk to you about general um, types of arguments and how they might uh, be addressed if they're not specific to you know particular mergers. Second thing I want to make clear, because I think it's very different than a number of the industries that um, uh, agencies that you all cover, is we are not a regulatory body. We get called the regulators all the time. We're not. We're law enforcement agency. And the reason that matters is we can't simply decree things. We can't simply say, this is legal, this is not legal, here's the framework that you have to apply or you violated our rule. We have to go to court uh, if we want to challenge uh, a transaction or a practice, either federal court or our own administrative uh, court. So that's just you have to bear that in mind when you're thinking about what it is that we do. I want to talk about a couple of areas that we've been focusing on lately. Um, one is, is hospital mergers. Uh, primarily, our focus has been on horizontal combinations. Hospitals that are competing with each other, competing both to negotiate with insurance companies and competing to actually get patients in the door uh, in the same geographic area. Um, there are hundreds of these transactions a year. We challenge a handful of them when we find that they're problematic. A little history is important. Hospital mergers and the FTC's concern about them is not something new. This has been going on for decades. And candidly, the FTC was on a bit of a losing streak in the 90s. And so they sort of sat back and regrouped and took a really hard look at what they were doing and why you know, the agency was finding that these deals were problematic, but the courts were not finding it. And so the Bureau of Economics did a number of retrospective studies. They looked at transactions that had gone through that we thought might be problematic, and lo and behold, found that there was quite clear evidence that these were, in fact, increasing prices. Uh, they use that to develop better models to determine the likelihood that a transaction would increase prices and use that as a way to start explaining the story. And lately, the government's been on more of a winning streak when it's come to hospital mergers. And we're continuing to, to bring challenges. We brought one um, about a month ago to a combination of West Virginia hospitals. And last week, we brought a challenge to a combination of Pennsylvania hospitals. Um, I should note that our analysis does take into account things like quality and cost savings and other benefits. We take very seriously um, a couple of things. One, whether a company is uh, failing, uh, if there are hospitals that are in fact are about to go bankrupt and are about to close their doors, you know, acquisition by a nearby competitor is better than the hospital simply closing the door. And so that is something that we take into account. We look at the quality uh, implications. If we were to see actual evidence that a transaction would increase uh, quality, even if it meant a little bit of a price increase, because that would be a quality adjusted neutral, right? If you pay $5 for something that's this good, but you pay $10 for something that's twice as good, that's not necessarily viewed as a price increase because when you look at the quality adjustment, uh, it might not be so problematic. That might be on balance good for consumers. We haven't seen that case. We haven't seen the case where the transaction is otherwise anti-competitive, but the quality outweighs the competitive concerns, but it's something that we're uh, alert to. 
Finally, something to note on hospital mergers is we frequently hear that there is a conflict between the Affordable Care Act and antitrust enforcement. It might be the question I have gotten most in the two and a half years of this job is, don't, isn't there a conflict between the antitrust laws and the ACA? And I would say an emphatic no. Uh, if you look at the ACA, it specifically says it's not meant to supplant competition. Uh, and we think that it is quite clear that the goals of the ACA and uh, antitrust are in, are in harmony, not in conflict. Um, what we often find is that there are other practical ways of achieving coordinated care and alternative payment models be beyond merging with a with a, with a close competitor. Um, the final thing to say is often when we do find a problem, the remedy in most transactions uh, outside the hospital area are divestitures. Um, you know, good example, grocery stores. You have two nearby grocery stores in a market. The solution is one of the grocery stores gets sold to somebody else. Competition is restored. Often in hospital mergers, we get promises um, that are proffered to us from the hospitals that they will simply agree to price caps, agree not to change their behavior, agree to increase prices only at the rate of inflation. Those are not remedies that the FTC finds acceptable for a couple of reasons. One, we can't guess what the right price is. Prices may go up, prices may go down. Second, the literature makes quite clear that when you put a price cap on something, the quality diminishes, and there's no way to basically make people promise to increase quality, to innovate as much as they otherwise would. And so we find uh, these sort of conduct remedies uh, uh, problematic. And I think that's why you see more than the usual number of hospital merger cases get litigated, because often there are two hospital combinations. There is no divestiture that will work uh, because that would undo the deal uh, entirely, and that's why I think you sometimes see uh, litigation there. Um, we do look, uh, all the things that I've said about hospital mergers really ap apply to other provider mergers. We've brought cases against outpatient clinic combinations. We've brought uh, challenges against combinations of, of physician practice groups as well. We've looked at, not yet brought a case vertical transactions when a hospital acquires a physician group. Um, it's an issue that could be problematic, uh, but it depends on the facts, and, and that's not a case that we've brought yet. Um, let me turn. There's lots more to talk about, um, but I, I want to make sure we all have time for questions and the like. Uh, let me turn for a minute to pharmaceutical transactions. Uh, you know, at one level, it's interesting because the pharmaceutical arena is really quite fragmented in the sense that there are literally dozens upon dozens upon dozens of companies that do pharmaceuticals. Um, what we look at is pretty narrowly the combination of particular products for particular end uses. We go so narrow as to determine whether or not they're the same mechanism of action. What we've also found through our investigations is that while the combination of a brand and the first generic company can uh, affect prices because when a generic comes in, um, it lowers the price. That when the second generic comes in, the brand sort of becomes somewhat irrelevant to the competition and you can have a market that just consists of the two generic products. And so a merger of two generics can be anti-competitive even if the brand is still out there. And that's true of the third and the fourth and the fifth generic. There's been a lot of empirical research that says at least up to four or five generics, the entry of each new one actually decreases price. And that's the reason that we're worried about uh, the combination of both branded com brand 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 generic and generic generic. Um, this has been a constant area of of uh, uh, enforcement. In, in the past decade, we've probably done several dozen consents, which have led to the divestiture of hundreds of products. We're seeing particularly large deals now, I think, because of the incentives uh, with the tax inversion um, uh, laws. And so we're seeing the really large transactions like the Pfizer Allergan, the Teva Allergan, um, uh, the Myelin Perigo, um, Teva Myelin spat, much of which was uh, caused by the uh, inversion tax laws. So we think we will con continue to see these. Um, 
For the most part, these transactions um, end up being allowed to proceed with divestitures. When we require divestitures, we require pretty fulsome divestitures. We want to make sure that everything that the buyer needs to continue to manufacture, sell, develop the product are part of the package. We typically require that there be a monitor. Um, it's chosen by uh, the companies involved. We approve the monitor. They pay for the monitor, but the monitor reports directly to us, not to them, to ensure that the commitments that they've made are carried out, and they're usually specialists in the area. Um, we don't use these just in pharmaceuticals, but they've been particularly prevalent uh, in pharmaceuticals. We always require an upfront buyer. We want to know who the buyer is going to be, and we want to make sure that they have the capabilities uh, to continue. Um, we're currently undertaking a remedy study to determine whether all of our consents are effective, and including that is a substantial component that's going to look at the pharma area consents. One final area um, that I want to mention. Uh, uh, is high drug prices. We get asked a lot, what can the FTC do about high prescription drug prices? Again, a couple of things to note. We are not a regulatory body. We can't simply put a cap on, uh, on prices, even if that were a, a good idea, which I think there's a, a lot of questions about whether or not that would be workable um, and whether or not it might reduce innovation. There'd have to be a lot of thought about that. That is not something we can do. We can only bring actions under the antitrust laws. Um, and so it is not illegal to have a monopoly. If you developed the better mousetrap, if you develop the better pharmaceutical product and you have um, patent rights to that, uh, you get a monopoly. And simply exercising that monopoly by charging a high price is not against the antitrust laws. Now, if you use that monopoly and do something that is exclusionary, for instance, you entered into an agreement with all of the only suppliers for uh, a particular pharmaceutical ingredient, that might be an act of monopolization that is anti-competitive. If you enter into an illegal agreement, a price-fixing agreement, an exclusive dealing agreement, again, that might be illegal. And we certainly, um, our reverse patent settlement pay for delay cases are an example of an agreement between competitors that may lead to higher prices that is, that is anti-competitive. But sometimes the high drug prices, and we look at them often, simply come about because a new owner had a different strategy and decided to increase the prices uh, as much as, as it could and buy itself uh, if the underlying, if the companies didn't have competing products and it's literally just a change of ownership and a different philosophy, that is not typically uh, something that we can do uh, anything about because it is not an antitrust violation. But we do look uh, every time we see this to see why it is that the prices have increased in the hopes that um, there might be something that we can do. So um, I think that's sort of an, an overview of some of the key things we're doing, and I'll uh, turn it over to our next speaker. Great, thanks. So let's switch over to this side, uh, to Andrea. Thank you so much, Marilyn, and thank you for having me here today. It's a real pleasure. Um, I am in private practice, uh, although I've spent my entire career doing antitrust, and I listen very intently anytime Debbie speaks because it's her advice that I end up having to consider and give back to my clients. Um, so this is just as informative for me as it is for all of you hearing her thoughts. Now, that said, um, I think I have a slightly different take on um, some of her comments. So I'm going to talk about sort of this, the, I'll talk about the insurance markets, I'll talk about provider and uh, hospital consolidation, and then lastly, just get on to the topic of pharma as well. In terms of the insurance markets, I'm not involved in any of these transactions. But the thing I'm most interested in seeing how DOJ, <coughs> pardon me, how DOJ undertakes this investigation is their concept of a national market and their concept of leverage. Uh, Bill Bayer, who's in charge of the antitrust division, a, a former partner of Debbie, somebody very well known to the antitrust community, has given speeches not about healthcare, but about, thank you, but about other kinds of industries where he's noted his concerns about what is leverage, what is having national power. And although healthcare antitrust analysis has some very distinct and discrete aspects that are completely 
different from other kinds of industries. I think it's important to remember that this is that's his view, that's his policy, that's his if that's his bent, then I can think you can expect that to carry over at least a little bit into his review of the insurance markets and into what DOJ is doing. So as I think about those two pending very large insurance mergers, the thing that occurs to me is that these are very well counseled, very sophisticated entities and that the analysis and that the investigation is likely to be very heavy on economics and very heavy on what we might consider natural experiments. So that is they're going to try and convince DOJ that they believe this is what will happen if these mergers are allowed to go through. Now, merger enforcement is predictive entirely in nature. You look at what the statute is, it's absolutely prospective. And so the economists are going to have um, the challenge of uh, the, the private party economists will have the challenge of convincing the government that they believe prices, quality, all of the things antitrust concerns itself with will be, prices will be reduced, but quality will not be reduced. So I think that I assume this investigation is proceeding as a very data heavy exercise. The other thing uh, that I think you see a lot of in the press, the CEOs and the other uh, leaders of these organizations are talking about how there's not much geographic overlap, that you know in certain regions they don't even compete against each other. And that could very well be true. But again, going back to sort of this view of national markets, um, you saw it in AT&T T-Mobile several years ago when the DOJ challenged it. Again, that's not a healthcare deal, but I think it's still illustrative. There, the DOJ said, uh, we think that you'll, we should not be reducing the number of national providers, even though on a regional level you may have had additional choices. You, see it, you saw it very recently, just last week, when the FTC challenged the Staples Office Depot deal. You saw it earlier this year when the FTC challenged the Cisco U.S. Foods transaction. The concept of a national market and having national power, uh, I think, is going to be, again, another challenge for these insurers to have to overcome. And then you move to the remedy. Um, obviously, you know, Debbie described in pharma markets how remedies are, are very much viable, very much uh, you know, a live solution to antitrust overlaps. The difficulty here is to whom will these insurance companies divest the covered lives? You have unprecedented consolidation. You, know, you basically have uh, four of the big five are involved in these deals. And so who is going to be able to step into the shoes of the lost, the lost competitive entity and restore that competitive balance. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see the way in which this investigation unfolds and what DOJ decides to do. I make no predictions about which way it will come out. Um, what I can tell you is I think that if it comes out, um, if, if the deal gets cleared, that there'll be some very robust remedies attached to it on a very regional level. And if the deal gets challenged, it's very likely to be because of this national leverage problem. On the issue of um, provider and hospital mergers, you know, again, my bias is, is to try and figure out a way to get my clients' deals through the FTC and the DOJ. And so, you know, I, I, I very much need to know, uh, get my, keep my finger on the pulse of what it is that both the FTC and DOJ are valuing. And the, the one thing that I have heard probably every time Debbie has said it is that there is no tension between the Accountable Care Act and the antitrust laws. The difficulty is when I talk with my clients, some of whom are very small, and they say, you know, we don't have a choice. There's no way for us to be able to accomplish, you know, the, to get the benefits of collaboration without the full-on merger. Um, and that may be unique to, this, to the quirky set of clients I happen to work on behalf of. Um, it may be symptomatic of something larger, but I do think there's a tension between the ACA, which values collaboration, and the antitrust laws, which sometimes think that collaboration can lead to improper consolidation. Um, so that's just a, a challenge that's there. Um, and I, I think it's something you'll continue to see. And I, and I think that's why you do have many um, in the healthcare side and on the provider side. You do see a lot of these challenges actually moving along into court. You know, a lot of these, you know, over the, the past maybe 10 years, there's a lot of deals that get abandoned. But I think you see a very consistent, on a very consistent basis, the FTC is going into court. Uh, uh, Debbie mentioned the um, Hershey case that they just filed, Hershey, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, there's also a case in Huntington, West Virginia that's ongoing. Um, those are very interesting, and, and I think you'll, you'll continue to see that tension play out between the ACA and the antitrust laws. 
Now, the thing I think that will be that 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 I absolutely tell all of my clients is if you're going to be interested in doing any kind of consolidation, the remedy must be structural. I think this is a bright line rule that I can actually very little of what I tell my clients I can say with confidence, 100% um, confidence. But this is one area where I tell them if you're preparing to go forward, a structural remedy is going to be absolutely necessary. And it's for all the reasons that you heard earlier, because these conduct remedies, where you just try and regulate someone's behavior, as opposed to fundamentally altering the, the backbone of the, the economics behind a transaction, they just aren't as effective. And the, the economics and the data and academic studies have borne that out. So you, you really need to be on the lookout for that. Now, an interesting quirk here is, that very occasionally, and, and with some increasing regularity, you see state attorneys generals who are willing to allow these transactions to go through with conduct remedies, um, whereas you have uh, you know federal enforcers who may not share that view. The West Virginia case I mentioned, which I think is it's Cable, C-A-B-E-L-L, -L, uh, I think it's pronounced Cable, and St. Mary's in Huntington. There, the attorney general actually signed an agreement blessing the transaction. And the parties agreed to many of the same kinds of conduct remedies Debbie described earlier. And the FTC there chose to challenge it even in the face of that attorney general approving the deal. Now, from my perspective, um, and I've been doing this a while, but not forever, um, my perspective, that's uh, unusual. Usually, you see great unity between what the FTC and the state attorneys generals do. You look at, and, and same thing on the DOJ side, you look at any of the complaints that they bring, and the first page will often take you, just the caption on the first page takes you two or three pages because they have all the names of the state attorneys general. So, very interesting to see the FTC depart there. Another interesting development, which is now about a year old, was in Massachusetts, um, the Boston area healthcare market, which is obviously a, a preeminent research center, a, a big focal point in the world of medical research. Um, Partners, which is the entity that owns all of the hospitals you've heard of up there, Brigham and Women's, Mass General, tried to buy um, South Shore Hospital and Hallmark Health System. And there again, the Massachusetts Attorney General came up with a consent decree that focused on conduct remedies. The um, a group of private parties, and I was involved in this, representing the private parties, decided to challenge the Attorney General's consent agreement. And ultimately, before a state court judge, the state court judge refused to enter the consent decree and said that what the conduct remedies would do would basically put a Band-Aid on a gushing wound. Um, so there, there's some interesting dynamics at play in healthcare markets you don't always see in other industries. What I tell my clients is that when you're thinking about moving forward with one of these deals, the very first thing we have to do is look at what is going to happen to quality, what does the economic evidence say. So whereas some other transactions pop up on my desk, we kind of get started from there, you know, they'll sign the agreement, we'll move forward. I think in these provider and, health and hospital deals, you really need to be prepared to do a lot of work on the front end because there, this is such an active enforcement environment that what you would hate to see is for the parties to invest time, resources, money, and then ultimately find themselves in the midst of a challenge. So um, it is incredibly important to start working early. On the pharma side, um, I actually think that I agree completely, um, and, and my experience is, is consistent with everything Debbie said. I think there's been very good consistency at the FTC over the past 20 years in terms of how they look at pharma mergers. And I think because of that consistency, there's real predictability. And so I do also do work on behalf of pharma clients, usually smaller ones, um, that are being acquired by some of these bigger ones. And so I, there too, I think you can draw some um, you know, fairly bright lines about what's gonna be permissible and what's not gonna be permissible. Um, as long as a remedy is available to a competitor that will be able to step into the shoes immediately of the entity that's lost, I think the FTC generally believes that, that pharma, uh, pharma divestitures can be very successful. Um, and so I would expect to see you know, things to continue uh, at the same rigor, same pace that what you're seeing now, as long as you keep that number of pharma competitors at a sufficiently high level. Uh, and I think certainly right now, there are plenty of very large players and, and plenty of mid and small players who um, really can uh, keep competitive dynamics at the point where they need to be. Great, thank you, Andrea. So let's turn now to George for the consumer perspective. So um, a good way to start thinking about the consumer perspective is that consumers want meaningful choice. Uh, when we have options, companies are spurred to compete for our interest and our loyalty, and that leads to better quality and better affordability. 
Uh, we don't necessarily want the most choices. We want the best choices. But that depends on keeping the marketplace open for creating meaningful choice, not just choice being available today or tomorrow or the next year, but over the long term, keeping the market open to choice. Uh, that's how we get uh, new thinking uh, and best choices in the future. And for consumers to get that meaningful choice, there needs to be enough competition at every level of the supply chain so that everyone has meaningful choice. Uh, the antitrust laws properly focus on us consumers, but we're affected by what happens in the rest of the marketplace. Uh, the supply chain in healthcare is a bit different. Uh, there's the additional complicating factor that most, insu most consumers encounter uh, the cost of healthcare is filtered through their insurance company. That's not as unique to healthcare as some suggest, but it's important and it affects the whole uh, picture. Um, so both the insurers and the providers claim to be in the consumer's corner, and each says we need to be strong to protect you. The providers say we want to bring our best professional judgment to bear on giving you the care you need, uh, and we can't have insurance companies interfering with our professional judgment. And insurers say providers have no restraint on what they charge except the restraints we put on them. <coughs> We're the ones who bring the costs down. And both are right to a point. But if either of them gets too much leverage over the other, what the antitrust laws call market power, then consumer choice gets restricted and quality, value, and innovation all suffer. So what we need is competition and the meaningful choice it translates into on all levels. Providers need enough insurers who provide access to patients, and insurers need enough providers who provide health care. Uh, each needs to have alternatives somewhere else to go so that neither can dictate terms. If a hospital network or group medical practice or drug maker or medical device manufacturer is powerful enough that an insurer can't afford not to contract with it, it can jack up its prices. And if an insurer is powerful enough that a hospital network or group medical practice or drug or device maker can't afford not to contract with it, it can force prices down so far that quality of care is jeopardized and innovation. We want <clears throat> doctors, hospitals, clinics, drug and device makers <clears throat> motivated to look for ways to lower prices <clears throat> without cutting corners on quality of care and other aspects of service <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> that consumers value. That's the difference between providers wanting to trim costs to compete as one aspect of their efforts. Thank you. <clears throat> versus being forced to cut service to the bone in hopes to survive. It's the difference between responding to incentives that flow from competition versus knuckling under to a market dictator. Similarly, we want insurers motivated to look for the best provider networks without being forced to contract with a network charging exorbitant rates just because it can in order to give policyholders access to the health care they need. The merging companies in healthcare or in any industry aren't necessarily aiming to reduce competition. Getting bigger and stronger can be a natural response to pursuing business opportunities in a changing marketplace. Changes in technology and in the marketplace and in consumer choices and in the law create opportunities and also uncertainties. And companies react by looking to make sure they are positioned to move ahead successfully. Part of that is making sure you have reliable sources for the inputs and partners you need to provide the products and services that consumers want to buy, and that you have reliable and effective ways to reach your consumers. And it can help to be big enough so that you know suppliers and partners and purchasers will see you as reliable yourself. But we get that, and so do the antitrust laws. Uh, similarly, it's okay to find ways to get ahead of your competitors so that you're the preferable choice. If that spurs you to make your products and services as high quality and as low cost as you can, because that's also good for consumers. But if it spurs you to look for ways to limit the competition you have to worry about, that can be harmful. Smoking gun memos or board presentations that vow to crush the competition can be colorful evidence, but on the focus in a merger investigation is not on the intent, but on the likely effect. <clears throat> the, 
The vast majority of mergers and integrations don't approach the levels of market concentration that threaten competition and consumer choice. But when they do approach those levels, they need to be looked at carefully, and when they cross the line, they need to be fixed or stopped. And figuring out where that line is and how close it is to being crossed can require extensive investigation and analysis, which is why we're thankful we have the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division. Companies seeking to justify a merger often have a checklist. They say the merger will create cost-saving efficiencies or synergies. They say other companies will enter the market and maintain the existing level of competition. And they say that if there's a concern in this or that specific local area or product or service offering, that can be fixed by selling off, divesting just that, just that one part of one or the other merging company to some other company who will take it over. But all of these justifications have their shortcomings and caveats and need to be carefully examined. And I think enough has already been said about the conduct remedies and trying to enforce that kind of promise. Uh, I won't go into that. But for these three that I did mention, um, the efficiencies aren't even relevant in less, until the merger takes market concentration past the threshold of concern and there's an antitrust issue in the first place. But once you are beyond that threshold, the efficiencies have to be enough to actually prevent any net harm to consumers. Um, and for the longer term, they have to prove that the drive to innovate is not going to be compromised. It's not a question of a balancing test that you're going to allow some harm to competition as a trade-off for some other supposed benefit. Um, and remember that complication, uh, that, excuse me, that competition um, inherently involves duplication. So if you're talking about the efficiencies as being, well, now there's two uh, accounting departments or two distribution systems, and now we'll only have to pay for one, and so we're going to save a lot of money. You don't have competition unless you have du duplication in all of those aspects, and so you can provide that meaningful choice. So an argument for eliminating those kinds of efficient or, or eliminating those kinds of costs is really an argument for allowing a monopoly. So we don't want to go there. Um, and um, the other question about the um, efficiencies, if they're like synergies, you know, we can get the best um, of both companies and all of their knowledge and expertise. You don't always have to acquire an entire company in order to get that expertise. You can hire, not acquire. And um, that's often a way to better preserve the competition. So the so-called efficiencies have to be um, uh, dependent on the merger uh, and not obtainable some other uh, way that's safer for competition. So the, the promise of other companies ready to enter the market and compete, either on their own or with the help of a divestiture handoff, also needs a reality check. If these companies are ready and willing to compete, why aren't they doing so already? Uh, and how do we know that they are up to the challenge and are in for the long haul? Now that's something that, as Debbie says, the Federal Trade Commission looks at carefully and makes, assures itself that that is going to be the case. But it's always going to be a roll of the dice with new entry. You just never know for sure. Often they don't work out. And often the most effective competitors are the ones who are already competing. Uh, furthermore, we don't want concentration allowed to increase right up to the very brink of where the harm to competition is obvious and immediate. Then there's no margin for error or, or for all too foreseeable developments beyond the control of the antitrust laws or anyone else. What if one of the current key players you're depending on later decides to downsize or close shop? The antitrust laws don't force someone to work, and they don't force a company to stay in business. It's also important to look not just at a snapshot of where competition is happening now and what current competition a merger would immediately eliminate, but also to look over the next hill at what the merger means for future competition. A consummated merger can't be easily unwound to restore lost competition. The antitrust laws recognize the importance of taking potential competition and market uncertainties into account. 
The Clayton Act is written to prohibit mergers that may substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly, which gives plenty of latitude for taking the longer view. We're encouraging the Justice Department to take a careful look at the pending uh, Anthos, Anthem Cigna and Aetna Humana uh, health insurance mergers, which combine the largest four health insurance companies, spanning numerous product sectors, I should say four of the largest five um, uh, health insurance companies, spanning numerous market sectors in numerous states and local areas. Uh, they are already in various degrees of direct competition with each other and are in prime position to expand further and into new territories. They would seem to already be as big as they need to be to make a go of it, on their own, without joining forces with their most able competitors. Earlier this year, we encouraged the FTC to take a hard look at the proposed Teva Milan merger, a hostile takeover that would have combined the two largest generic drug makers in their vast generic and specialty drug portfolios. Teva abandoned its takeover efforts in the face of FTC concern. The healthcare marketplace is complex in how it operates and how it motivates providers, insurers, and consumers. A regulatory framework has developed over many years and is still evolving to work within that and shape uh, that complex environment and to help safeguard consumers, help keep costs under control, and help make a full range of healthcare products and services available. But even the best regulatory framework works better where competition within appropriate regulatory limits gives businesses an additional incentive to want to improve service while holding down prices and providing better value. Regulation and competition both work best when they work hand in hand. Great, thank you. So we're going to open up for uh, Q&A right now. We are videotaping, by the way. This uh, videotape and a transcript will appear on the AHCJ, the, Amer the Association of Healthcare Journalists website, as well as on Health Affairs and the Alliance for Health Reform. So we have a couple of roving mics. So can someone hand Chris Fleming a microphone, please? Hi, uh, thank you guys. These were great presentations. And if you uh, could introduce yourself, please. Oh, sorry. Even uh, though I just <laughs> named you. <laughs> uh, Chris Fleming from Health Affairs Blog. Uh, I wanted to pick up on a, a theme that came up in Deborah's and then in Andrea's uh, presentations. The idea, uh, Deborah, you said that there was no conflict between antitrust and the ACA. Uh, Andrea, you seem to suggest that uh, some of your clients, particularly the smaller ones, felt that there was. Uh, I wonder what Deborah's reaction would be to what Aunt Andrea said, and then also Andrea, your reaction to Deborah's point uh, that she made that there are ways uh, short of full-scale merger to achieve the kinds of uh, ACA goals, coordinated care, better quality uh, that providers can take that will not be as harmful to competition. Uh, sure, thanks. Um, so a couple of points. Uh, first, just the empirical. There are hundreds of ACOs. ACOs are all collaborations among different folks. Sometimes they involve uh, hospitals, sometimes they involve hospitals and uh, physicians. They scan the universe. Hundreds of, uh, of ACOs. How many have been challenged by the antitrust authorities? Right, zero. Not one. Um, that suggests that there are, in fact, ways for folks to, to collaborate. So that's sort of, sort of point one, is that, that folks are finding a way to do it that do not run afoul of the antitrust laws, and I think that's really important. The second thing is to talk about the distinction between collaboration, even among competitors, uh, and something that leads to increased consolidation. And, and the example I already always use, and it might be showing my age, but I remember as a kid the incredible edible egg campaign, right? Remember that? Um, the advertisement, it's sort of like the, you know, got milk campaign, right? This was a group of competitors. The egg manufacturers all got together and said, let's spend some money to promote the health benefits of eggs, that eggs are okay to eat. And that was a situation where they collaborated um, on delivering uh, a message to consumers. They did not simultaneously, however, fix the price of eggs, as far as we know. Um, that's the difference between collaboration and consolidation. And I think it's imp important to bear in mind we often hear things like, well, to do population health management, you really need data on a larger population than maybe that that's covered by one hospital. 
Well, you can do that. There's nothing in the antitrust laws that prevents all the hospitals from, in an area from saying, you know what, it would be great if we all got on the same IT system so that we can share information with the physicians in the area. It's okay if we sit down and have our quality experts sit down and go, what's your rate of MRSA? You know, we have a, we're trying to figure out if the rate of MRSA is something endemic to the city and the population that we're in or something we're doing bad as a hospital or need to be doing better at. You can share that stuff without at the same time having to set the prices together or negotiate together with payers. So there are lots of things that you can do that are collaborative, even with your competitor, even with the hospital next door, that do not involve the kind of consolidation and increased leverage against payers that would increase the, the price of health care? Well, you know, I, I don't necessarily disagree with anything you just heard. I mean, for some, the use of ACOs has proven incredibly valuable and very viable. And you see that around the country, and lots of lots of uh, lots of these are springing up. I think you'll continue to see it. But for other entities, their business reality is such that they can't do these high these high touch areas of collaboration and get the efficiencies they need to bring costs down without having that complete unity of interest and without being able to go negotiate singularly with payers. And I think that the background that's interesting to me here is that. Um, you know, we haven't talked too much about how the payers interact with the providers, but for many of the clients I counsel, their greatest fear are those yearly or buy or, or uh, every other year negotiations they have with the big payers because those payers say to them, well, your reimbursement rates are going down 10% no matter what. And then for the providers to have to make adjustments and to be able to do the things that they want to do to keep the quality of care up and to keep you know, their entities functioning in the way that they want while they're being paid less, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Um, so you know, Debbie's absolutely correct, and I, and I give this advice all the time. There are tons of things you can do short of a full-on merger, short of sitting and then negotiating with these payers, which is the, the third rail, in, frankly, in these provider deals. Um, but it's hard. And it's really hard for these businesses whose on the ground, boot, boots on the ground reality makes it especially challenging. Can, can I ask one quick follow up? Um, if you get a microphone. I was just sort of intrigued because people make the, often make the distinction, uh, you know, whether the, combina the combination is often presented as a way to increase quality. Uh, and then the other mm -hmm. side will say, no, no, it's a way to have market power and increase payment. You seem just now to make the case that, in fact, you can't divide those two because if you don't have the market power to uh, negotiate effectively with the payers and get better payment, you, can't, you don't have the resources to increase the quality. So should uh, regulators and law enforcement agencies be looking more favorably on combinations that are partly designed to negotiate, to have more market power to negotiate with the payers? No, that's not what I was uh, trying to suggest. I mean, to, you know, for me, the, the quality argument is largely separate. And to be candid, most hospitals, most providers around the country are pretty good on quality. And so I would never rest, uh, you know, rest my defense on being able to say, well, we're going to see a dramatic increase in quality here. That, that's not what I was trying to suggest. If I could make one or two more points, which is, uh, the health insurers care about this stuff as much as, uh, as anybody else. And we routinely hear from them that a particular merger is completely fine. Uh, and an example of that was we looked at a merger of a, a large academic medical center um, that was filled to the gills. Uh, and it was combining with a small local um, provider some miles away, I think. But clearly in the, the same geographic market. Uh, and the plan was, you know what, I'm going to take the kind of routine primary care sort of hospital things and move it to this, this hospital which has excess capacity so that I can keep this, the beds open for tertiary and, and quaternary care and that sort of thing. And we talked to the insurers, and the insurers said, yeah, you know what, we, this is not going to be a problem for us. In fact, it's going to reduce. 
uh, costs for us. And, and we let that one go. I mean, the insurers have a good sense of, you know, do we think that this is going to increase prices or decrease prices? Do we think that this collaboration is, is beneficial? If they see something that is going to reduce their cost and improve quality, reduce cost, right? You get people in and out of the hospital, you have fewer readmissions. So the interests can often be uh, quite aligned. And so we do look at the, the facts of this. And I would note that you know, so far the courts have agreed with us, and the best example of that is the case in, in Idaho with St. Luke's, where the judge basically said, you know, look, I get what they're doing, and I completely agree with what George said. This is not about bad intent. I don't, you know, we don't, we sometimes see bad documents, but often we find that, you know, the hospital systems, in fact, want to do this for the right reasons. It's just we don't think it's necessary or sufficient um, to achieve the goals. And the judge in uh, the St. Luke's case agreed with us that while he had every belief that they were trying to do the right thing with a combination of these uh, physician practice groups, that in fact there were other ways to achieve it. There was evidence that they were already working on many of these things even without the, the merger and therefore could accomplish them. And he basically found that he didn't think the ACO conflicted and he wasn't prepared to do a little healthcare experiment uh, uh, instead of uh, following the, the you know, antitrust laws that have been around for 100 years and I think have served us quite well. I would just add uh, briefly that in those negotiations you were referring to, we want the, um, the uh, providers to have to negotiate with the insurers, but we also want the insurers to have to negotiate with the providers. And so uh, we want each of them to have effective alternatives so that no one can really lay down a take it or leave it. And so we're concerned about this spiral where the providers are saying the insurers are too powerful, we need to get powerful too, and the insurers are saying the providers are getting more powerful, we need to get more powerful too, and you end up with what has been long referred to in uh, antitrust circles as a sumo, sumo wrestler uh, situation, where one says, <clears throat> there's a sumo wrestler over there, put us in to do battle for you against that one, and they end up usually finding that it's in their best interest to accommodate each other in some way, and then the people on the outside uh, end up uh, suffering from that. Hi, uh, Joyce Frieden from MedPage today. Um, I was interested, uh, Ms. Feinstein, you said that you did challenge some physician practice mergers, and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, what triggers uh, interest uh, from the FTC in that area and what you might be looking for because you said what you haven't done is challenge the hospitals trying to buy the physician practices. Sure. So um, the, the case that we brought is the St. Luke's case in Nampa, Idaho, and it combined um, the two largest physician practice groups uh, in Idaho. People sometimes refer to that as a hospital physician merger because St. Luke's was a hospital that had a physician group. What we challenged was the horizontal combination between the two physician groups, not the vertical part of the transaction, which I'll get to uh, in a minute. We can hear about it all sorts of ways. We can hear about it from the, most of these are under the Hart Scott reporting requirement. They're not 70 plus million dollar transactions. We can often hear about things from the state AG. Uh, we can hear about it from the press and we look at the facts and decide whether or not there's a high enough concentration and if the payers are telling us that they're worried that it will change the bargaining dynamics, that's something that we might have a concern about, and, and St. Luke's was a case we brought it. Uh, we brought uh, the vertical transaction where we might be interested with a hospital combining with a physician group. Take the most extreme example, which is that you have a dominant hospital in an area, you know, one with 80 percent uh, market share, just to give a, a hypothetical, and it acquires every single cardiologist in the city, every single cardiologist within a 50 mile radius, say. Um, now you've got another hospital, it's got no cardiologists. It's got nobody to refer cardiology patients to it and suddenly it's foreclosed and it's not going to be able to compete to provide cardiac services and that would allow the hospital, which may have an average of 80%, suddenly to have 100% uh, in a particular uh, market and exclude um, all uh, competition. Um, 
On the other hand, there are price reducing effects from uh, vertical transactions that well, a well-known effect is that you eliminate the double marginalization. Simply put, if I've got two people, they each need to make money. If I've got one person, they can figure out overall what the, what the margin is. So there are benefits to vertical transactions, which is why neither federal agency has actually gone to court to challenge any vertical transaction in any industry. Uh, in decades, there have been many settlements in vertical uh, t transactions. I've worked on a number of them. An easy example of that is, is Pepsi and Coke both bought their bottlers downstream, and the FTC entered into consent decrees um, to deal with some of the problematic vertical aspects while allowing them to go through because they, they did see the benefits uh, to that. One of the things that we would look at is entry. You know, it's one thing to enter with a new hospital, right? It's time consuming, it's expensive. There can be certificate of need laws that make it particularly problematic. Your competitor can challenge whether or not there's a need for another hospital. You know, CON laws exist in, in the healthcare area, but you know, in what other world does a competitor get to weigh in on whether or not you get to open a business? It's, it's a bit unusual. And, a bit problematic for the uh, antitrust uh, enforcers, but that doesn't exist with respect to physician practices, and it may be quite easy for entry to occur, and we have seen examples where we've looked at physician combinations, particularly in urban areas, particularly in areas near lots of medical schools, where we say, you know what, the combination of these two physician practice groups won't be a problem because uh, it would be easy for somebody to bring in new physicians of that particular type to be able to remedy any foreclosure concerns or to remedy any horizontal concerns. So it's very, very, very much a fact-specific issue depending on the type of um, physician group that you're talking about, depending on the geographic area, depending on, on hospitals and, and all sorts of things. So um, again, it's something we're alert to, but something we've not yet brought a case on. Okay, yes, Joyce. Uh, Jill Wexler with Pharmaceutical Executive Magazine. Um, while nobody did specifically talk about the tax inversion incentives to pharmaceutical industry mergers, I'm just wondering if the financial benefits of such deals might be that you see evidence that they might be driving merger activity that otherwise wouldn't make sense or wouldn't be beneficial um, because of these financial incentives that that they raise other problems, or conversely, that they're driving highly beneficial mergers of involving smaller companies that can greatly benefit, um, that wouldn't take place without such financial incentives. You know, I'm not in the boardrooms of these companies. I really can't comment on what's driving them to do the mergers. I mean, I think there's a lot of speculation that a number of these are, are pushed by uh, inversion, but, you know, we haven't seen it. And ultimately, uh, the reason um, uh, unless it's an anti-competitive reason that a transaction comes about really is of no moment to us because we're looking at the effects of the transaction. And I would say if, if a client came to me and said we really want to do this because of the inversion benefits, I would say it's neither here nor there. We need to look at what the antitrust outcomes will be. Um, Bob Rohr, Freelance. Um, there's there's a trend I see emerging of, of pr providers, uh, particularly larger ones, doing their own self-insurance, and um, more like on, on the Kaiser model, going uh, but going from the care to, into the insurance side of that. How is that going to affect the consumer? Uh, in, in some ways, I can see advantages of, uh, of savings in some ways, and certainly clarity in that you know what you're buying when you buy an insurance policy. You're buying certain sets of providers and things. So how is that going to sort out? I think if it uh, gives consumers more choices, that's good. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong about that kind of a vertical um, integration as long as um, it doesn't foreclose options in the way Debbie was just talking about um, uh, insurance companies who can't get providers anymore because the providers are all doing their own insurance. Uh, that would have to be a, you know, looked at separately. Uh, it might be just an, a change in the way that healthcare is delivered, and if that ultimately takes over, that's not necessarily bad for consumers as long as there's enough choice in the supply lines so that consumers have choices. I think I saw a question down here. Hi, I'm Sarah Carlin with Politico. 
in terms of pharmaceutical mergers, you talked a lot about divestitures, but how does FTC think about the future competition that's lost and the innovation that doesn't happen, or even in the generic drug space, the future competition that's lost in that space, especially as more and more consolidation occurs? That's a good question. So we do look, um, and especially in the pharmaceutical area, we look at future competition, and that's because it's easier to look at in the uh, pharmaceutical area because there's a very clear um, uh, process for getting clearance. You have to go through the, the FDA pipeline. And so we are in regular contact with the FDA when we're looking at transactions to say, okay, who's filed for approval for this kind of product? And, um, you know, who's in the queue to develop a generic for this kind of product? And so our, uh, uh, our consents routinely talk about if you were to search the word, you know, FTC complaint and, you know, future, you would see a lot of markets where we talk about um, divestitures occurring because it would eliminate competition that would happen in a couple of years. And so a huge number of our uh, transactions look at that. To date, we have found that um, there are enough different companies that tend to innovate uh, just generally that we have not worried about uh, kind of a more global innovation concern, but it's something that we would be alert to if the number of pharmaceutical uh, companies got smaller. What we found is that innovation comes from a number of places, uh, small companies, large companies, medium companies, uh, and uh, there's just there's still a huge amount of innovation. So we have tended to look at it sort of product by product um, to see what the pipeline looks like uh, to determine whether or not we have particular problems, but we are alert to the larger issues issue as well. Uh, from looking at uh, complaints from government enforcement agencies, court decisions, and studies, we can get a pretty good idea of what is going on or what is happening in uh, specific sectors. When we have this discussion, we're talking in general about mergers in, among doctors, hospitals, insurance companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies. Do you have any sort of cross-cutting reflections about the larger changes and how they <coughs> may or may not be considered in antitrust enforcement? In other words, is there anything besides just sector-specific analysis? that you or others should consider? Uh, you know, for the most part, when people have come to bring their mergers to us, it is really much pretty specific to the facts of that merger. We do hear of some of these broader landscape issues, like the need to, to um, move towards collaboration, the need to move towards risk-based um, contracting. We hear a lot about population health management. But the analysis that we use uh, in every case is really pretty much driven by the guidelines and the questions we ask with respect to those things are, are they necessary? Are they sufficient? In other words, are these, um, you know, the first question we ask is, as, as Andrea mentioned is, you know, is this anti-competitive? You don't even get to, and George said the same thing, you don't even get to the efficiencies analysis until you've decided that there's a problem. So I think many, many, many transactions are probably driven by these broader ACA goals. We don't have to have that combination discussion if the transaction isn't problematic. And, you know, there are hundreds of hospital mergers every year, and, you know, we investigate, you know, a, a handful, a um, couple dozen that we'll actually look at, you know, with some degree of, of, of significance beyond looking at the initial filing and realizing the hospitals are 200 miles apart and they don't compete. Um, and then, you know, it's an increasingly small funnel to where we're actually challenging them. It's in those handful uh, that we actually have to have the conversation about are the efficiencies merger specific. The very fact that we clear dozens and dozens of transactions um, and challenge only a handful suggests to me that to the extent that these broader um, things are going on, that we're doing a pretty good job of, of, of accommodating them in the sense that I shouldn't say that. that. That's not the way I want, meant to say this. It, it means that these broader things really aren't affecting most transactions in terms of the antitrust analysis uh, that we look at because 
a lot of them are getting cleared. So a lot of people are able to do the kinds of transactions they want without the antitrust problems. And it's really only a handful uh, that are problematic. And in those, as I said, we've gone through the analysis and determined that, that they're still problematic. Hi, Rich Daly with Healthcare Financial Management Magazine. I uh, just wanted to follow up a little bit more of a sort of zoomed in question than Robert's. Um, one of the issues that are frequently raised by hospitals looking at mergers and acquisitions and an issue that comes up in accountable care organizations that you were talking about is how to keep the patients that they are financially responsible for within their system of care. It's a big problem in ACOs and it's a big problem outside. We're dealing with private payers who have these um, you know, managed care systems, what have you, that when there's a, uh, an incentive to improve the care for this patient, but the patient keeps leaving your system. Um, is there any approaches that you found? You talked about other systems, payment systems that are effective, short of mergers and acquisitions. Are there any approaches that you could point to that are effective in terms of retaining those patients that you know providers should be looking to instead? Yeah, it's, um, it's a good question. It's really not something that the antitrust agencies look at. I mean, we're more focused on the question of is it necessary for these two entities to combine so they can address the concern that you're worried about? And the question we would ask there is, are there any competitive aspects and how does that balance against the um, possibility that if they combine, they would be able to do more risk-based contracting? And there we would talk um, to the insurers, uh, among other places, to try to get a view on that. If the insurers say, yeah, that would be really helpful, we think that combining they could reduce the costs um, because they would be able to better engage in risk-based contracting and we think that that would be a good thing um, that would be meaningful to us if on the other hand the insurance companies say look at I understand that maybe the motivation but all it's going to end up doing is increasing their price to us when they jointly negotiate that would that would uh, tend to concern us so uh We've talked a lot about the um, what goes into making these kinds of decisions. Um, but George brought up an interesting question he, or, or statement. He said that these uh, uh, deals or act this activity can't be easily unwound. And I'm wondering if we could talk just a little bit about what kind of recourse there is um, if <coughs> the promised benefits don't come to fruition and maybe it appears that uh, um, there is some uh, uh, detriment from the activity. Is there any kind of recourse? Is it possible to unbundle a merger? Has it ever been done? Are there penalties, sanctions? Is that... Uh... So again, um, going to the question of we're a law enforcement agency, so no sanctions, um, uh, unless they violated a uh, consent decree. If they've entered a consent decree and violated it, we can get civil penalties. Um, it's why we have a hart scott Rodino Act, which requires pre-notification of large transactions so that we can take a look at them and challenge them before the combination occurs. The best example in the hospital area of a combination that occurred was the um, uh, Evanston North Shore Highland uh, transaction in the Chicago suburbs some years ago. The transaction um, uh, uh, was not challenged when it was uh, ad additionally occurred. The prices went up dramatically. The FTC challenged it after the fact um, and got a remedy. The problem was is that the companies had been so intertwined by then and had a really, um, I think, uh, somewhat successful cardiac uh, program that would have gotten sort of torn apart if the two hospitals had been split up. And so the remedy was that the hospitals would each separately uh, negotiate if the payers wanted to. The payers, no payer took advantage of it, probably because it's it's a hard thing to figure out how it's really going to work at the end of the day. They both have the same CEO, and um, having clear division is 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 challenging. And for whatever reason, um, the the benefits of competition really didn't come about after that challenge, which is why we are so disappointed when we lose. A, a good example of a, of a time we lost a hospital merger and, and ultimately were unable to achieve any remedy is um, with the Phoebe Putney Palmyra case down in Georgia. There we did challenge the transaction when we first learned about it before it was closed. The district court decided that we were not entitled to relief because um, uh, the transaction was immunized by the state action doctrine um, because uh, one of the uh, hospitals was a basically a state 
state-run, state-owned entity, and uh, the state action doctrine says that if the state immunizes competition, the federal government can't do anything about it. Um, and uh, we didn't think that the state action doctrine, in fact, applied, but the hospitals were allowed uh, to merge. Um, went up to the 11th Circuit. The 11th Circuit said, wow, this is really any competitive thing. This is a problematic deal, but I think the state action doctrine applies. We then went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said in a 9-0 decision, the state action doctrine doesn't apply. The FTC absolutely has jurisdiction to look at this. But by then, the hospitals had merged. We tried to get a divestiture, but because of complicated CON laws, uh, it was unclear. Um, it did not appear that we were ever going to be able to separate the hospitals and have one of them sold to another party. So we couldn't get any remedy whatsoever. Um, highly, highly problematic. I mean, really troubling to all of us at the commission who went through this, um, which is why we try so very hard um, to go after it the first time. We are technically allowed to go after a transaction at any time, even after it's closed, uh, even if we had looked at it um, originally. I think the odds that we would go after a transaction that we had investigated seriously and cleared um, uh, are, are it, it has not happened um, in recent times. I can't predict whether it would happen uh, in the future. I do think that it's why we try so hard to get it right and why we're always going to err on the side of consumers as opposed to the promises that somebody has about why it's going to end up being a, a good transaction. And something that uh, Debbie just alluded to um, and uh, you had referenced in, in my statement that, that once it's done, uh, everybody makes their adjustments. You know, people who worked for one entity or the other are either brought into the new entity or they um, are let go and they go off to look for work elsewhere. Um, suppliers, uh, customers make their adjustments. So you really don't have the uh, contents of the two companies left in order to be, be able to make a clean break uh, between them again. And it's often um, referred to with the metaphor of trying to unscramble eggs. Uh, you just can't, you know, th there's one company there and it's too late. So that's why you have to do it before the merger happens. So given this reality, do you have everything that you need? Do you have all of the uh, legal tools that you need? to be able to uh, conduct a rigorous pre-approval process? Or do you need anything from the policymakers? Anything more? <laughs> um, I, look, I think the antitrust laws have served us very well for um, uh, over a uh, hundred years. Um, I think that we're able to to look at transactions. It's a, a, a challenge in terms of, you know, um, I don't think uh, any government agency will tell you it always has as many resources as it's like, but I think we do a, a very good job uh, with what we have. We're able to look at a lot, and I think we're, we're pretty confident that we're, you know, looking at the transactions that really need to be looked at, challenging the ones that are, are really problematic, and, and letting those that are not problematic uh, go through as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Great. So, uh, okay, so this will, let's wrap up uh, here. Last question. Thank you. Uh, Jad Shamsuddin, uh, Congressional Quarterly. I just had a question regarding the certificate of need laws. How much does that factor into um, your analysis when you're blocking uh, a merger, a state certificate of, like, whether you can effectively do it and how, the, how much that's going to hamper future entrance, uh, f future competition? Um, so a couple of things to say on certificate of need laws. We look at it in, in virtually every transaction to see whether they exist because it um, answers the question of whether or not entry is likely uh, to occur. Um, we often hear that, that entry may occur. I, you know, in the hospital um, merger situation, you know, if there's actually a hospital being built, that may convince us. And we have seen situations where there are new hospitals coming in. And so the snapshot that we're looking at at this particular moment in time does not reflect what it's going to look like in a year, and we may decide that if you ignored the future entry, um, the transaction might be problematic, but given that other people are building hospitals, we're not concerned. On the other hand, if those 
plans of people are, are, are hampered by certificate of need laws, we may be more skeptical that the entry will in fact occur um, that a hospital says uh, it wants to do because of that. So we'll look at that in the context of whether or not um, we think entry is likely. We have, when asked, we'll, we'll weigh in on, on certificate of need laws. We have um, um, an Office of Policy and Planning, and they are frequently invited by legislators to uh, provide views on different legislation, whether it be COPA, Certificate of Public Advantage, or CON laws, or, or um, other legislation that affects healthcare providers, like the amount of certification that advanced practice registered nurses need, that sort of thing. There's a lot on our website because we make all of this public. Whenever a state asks us to weigh in on legislation, or if any of the federal uh, agencies ask us to weigh in on particular things, there's a lot in the healthcare area that we've been asked to weigh in on. It's all up on our um, website. So we, we do look at these sorts of things pretty routinely. Fantastic. So I would like you to do one last thing for me, and that is inside your packet you have a smaller piece of paper that's at the front. It's in a blue evaluation form. We would love to hear what you have to say, uh, not just because we want to hear what you have to say, but we're going to be doing these kinds of events uh, once every couple of months, and they're for you. Um, we want to hit the subjects that you want to hit. We want to bring in the speakers you would like to hear from. So please tell us very specifically if you have a, a thought about what subject is pressing, you want to hear more about it, what speaker. Um, so if you could take a minute and fill out the evaluation, that would be great. Um, I'd like to thank you all for getting up very early on a Tuesday morning. And uh, again, I'd like to thank Health Affairs for um, their partnership and also the JKTG Foundation for its support of these briefings.